Afghanistan, and still the scene of one of the world's bloodiest conflicts. Scores of men, women and children are killed each day in battles between the Taliban and rebel forces. I want my country to be peaceful again. I've had enough of this war. Women and girls want peace and security. The war is exhausting our children. I want peace for my country too. I want to be the leader, the Muslim who's able to bring peace to the region. The war is no good to anyone. It's useless. This is Rostak, close to the Tajikistan border. It's one of the few remaining towns in Afghanistan not under Taliban rule. It's controlled by the rebel leader, Major Ahmed Shah Massoud, a formidable military chief who continues to oppose the Taliban command in Kabul. This market town with 40,000 inhabitants has become a safe haven for Afghanis escaping the advancing Taliban forces. Because of Rostak's geographic isolation, it's a town which has preserved its medieval Muslim character. And although the town has never been subject to the ravages of war, its people are in an economic wilderness. Twenty years of fighting has reduced the population to living on the breadline. With the war just a stone's throw away, few provisions can get through. Now there are major food shortages and the people are suffering. Since the war started, I haven't been able to sell my knives and earn my living. At the end of the month, I only have five to ten thousand Afghanis. What can you do with that? Five thousand Afghanis is the equivalent of about four dollars, a miserly sum considering a family in Afghanistan needs at least 10 times that amount for a decent standard of living. Although there's local produce for sale, few Afghanis can afford it. And as the conflict continues, the influx of refugees looking for work multiplies daily. In the territories occupied by the Taliban militia, they establish how many people live in each area using mullahs, which are population figures. This census allows them to enroll 16 men per area and per mosque whenever they need to. I didn't come here to join Massoud's forces. I just came to work. I think that my future as an engineer is here, if freedom of speech and actions come back to Afghanistan. I want to work for my country freely, but if the military pressure continues, I want to leave Afghanistan. He's not alone. The poverty and lack of jobs has driven thousands to flee their homeland for work in the West. Bezmala, like so many other Afghans, was lucky to find a way out. He works as a chauffeur for an international organisation and receives around $150 a month, enough to allow him to own a two-roomed house which he shares with his four children. Even so, his family are still living under severe hardship. 
At the moment, my children go to school and the hospital is still open. But there's a lack of medication because it never reaches us. Our children are sick and not properly cared for. But the other daily problem is food. We don't have enough of it. Schooling highlights one of the major divides between the Taliban fundamentalists and the rebels. Here, under the liberal Afghan system, girls are allowed to go to school, a rare privilege, especially since so few children receive an education. Although schooling is officially free in Afghanistan, only about one child in a hundred goes to school. In Rostock, it's better than average, with over 650 children attending this school, a little over one per family. But with the influx of refugees, the classes are swelling, and the teachers are struggling against the odds. Their monthly salary of seven dollars hasn't been paid for several months. Islam is so entrenched in Afghanistan that even in this secular school, the Quran is revered. The Quran is the book of God, and we believe in the holy book. And we're in a secular school. This woman is a primary school head teacher in Talakan, a town to the south of Rostak. She's trying to encourage the children and staff to take pride in their school again, but it's not easy. The girls' school has just reopened after it was closed down by the Taliban. Although Masood's rebels have reclaimed the town and liberated the school, the constant upheaval is taking its toll. You know this dirty war has been going on for 20 years. It's taken our young people away, who are the pride and joy of the country. Women and girls, young and old, have died, and many are in exile. Yet despite all that, someday when peace and quiet prevail, children who are thirsty for knowledge will come here to study. Not everyone has taken up arms in our country. Some are fighting and some want to learn. Women and girls want peace and security. The war is exhausting our children. They were afraid as soon as they heard the first Kalashnikov shots. In order for our children to learn, the UN needs to bring back peace. This brave teacher will say no more. The Taliban could return any time. It takes 10 hours by truck to cross the 150 kilometers which separate Talakan from Rostak. The few vehicles which cut through the region have to use impossible mule tracks and riverbed channels to navigate. The road network is either completely destroyed or mined. <laughs> Sifting the earth sometimes uncovers surprises, such as these unexploded bombs. Everything that's found on the roadside is used for rebuilding. The shells are used to reconstruct the same roads they were supposed to destroy. These dusty tracks are also home to the trail of supplies which are usually carried by children to farms several kilometers away. Although it can be dangerous, they have a crucial role in carrying a precious supply of water into an otherwise arid desert. Flocks of sheep and long-haired goats can also be seen on the trail. Legend has it that in northeast Afghanistan, this long-haired variety originates from the story of the Golden Fleece because they can be used to recover the gold which abounds in these parts. But such prosperity is long gone.
With each year, the life expectancy in Afghanistan reaches new lows. The health of the nation is rapidly deteriorating. Although Talakan's pharmacies may seem fairly well stocked, none of these shelves contain basic medicines. They can only be found in the Médecins Sans Frontières hospital pharmacy, and then only in insufficient quantities. Each year, 268,000 children under the age of five die unnecessarily of diseases which with the right medicine are simple to control. And in this desperate climate, infant mortality rises. Here, it's 30 times higher than in Western Europe, at 163 deaths per thousand. Each year, more than 8,000 patients are hospitalized in Talakan. The most serious injuries are from the war. The Taliban wounded, as shown here, are still treated by the doctors without being ostracized, despite the turmoil they've caused the medical staff during their relentless assaults on the town. My name is Malam Mantala. I was injured at Takat. Will you fight with the Taliban afterwards? No. The doctors will not easily forget the weeks of fundamentalist army occupation. As a general rule, we didn't have any particular problems after the Taliban arrived. But they did cause difficulties when it came to women. This was because of their general policy. The Taliban consider the duty of women to be separate from that of men. Some of our doctors, therefore, couldn't treat women as freely as they can today. The difference between the period of Taliban occupation and now is enormous. Under the Taliban, women were unable to come for a consultation without being accompanied by a man, which is not easy for a female doctor. Apart from that, they used to stop us and beat us up. Every day we lived with this obsessive fear. We were not able to freely practice. If a woman came to casualty, the theology students wouldn't let her in the hospital. She would stay in the street and I couldn't go near her. Being only five kilometers from the front line, the distant, dull rattle of artillery means the people of Talakan live constantly to the rhythm and pulses of the war. Despite the constant tension, life here buzzes with an unexpected air of normality. People get by as best they can for a town in the center of a region which has seen some of the conflict's most vicious fighting. The numerous militia are indicative of the region's struggling economy. Each soldier receives a dollar for every day spent at the front line. <laughs> Just a few meters away from the bazaar, in a lavish setting, Major Masood is receiving guests. The rebel leader knows he won't be able to conquer the fundamentalists with only his Tajik forces. He needs to gain support from district mayors, neighboring clans. So he plays the role of an intermediary, moving between meetings to listen to the region's power brokers. The recapturing of the town has enabled him to remove all risk of isolating his Panjshir Valley and to secure crucial delivery routes with Tajikistan. What he has to do now is form a united front with clans which were formerly enemies. 
In the evening, Massoud takes his staff and other key figures to a hilltop to survey the town's defence lines. If you take up your positions here and fire in this direction, no Taliban will be able to touch you. It was a brief meeting, as fighting resumed a few hours later. The Taliban launch an attack five kilometres from Talakan. After this initial surprise flurry, Massoud's forces organise their counter-offensive. While the population prepares to flee from another battle, the soldiers make their way up to the front to defend the town from the trenches. Often the only sign of fighting in this drawn-out civil war is the Taliban planes flying stealthily above them to attack the front line. The Talakan people observe the sky as if watching a display, but then the reality of fighting strikes home. The Taliban planes begin to target the town. The first bomb hits the wasteland of a residential area. Luckily, there are no victims, but five houses are seriously damaged. This house in the suburbs has been blown up and its eight occupants killed. Some neighbours remain in a state of shock. The aftermath of a bomb is a solemn reminder that the war in Afghanistan, like all wars, has the greatest impact on the population. At the hospital, amidst the sound of wailing, dead or injured civilians are brought in on carts. Their mutilated bodies, a stark realization as to the severity of the fighting. As people look on, they can't help but remember their own dead, killed during 20 years of war. As other carts arrive, it's clear that children have also been killed in the latest round of bombing. During the course of the war, between 300 and 400,000 children have lost their lives. A Pakistani vehicle seized from the Taliban carries the bodies of Massoud's rebel soldiers killed at the front line. They were taken prisoner early this morning by the Islamic militia and are executed in cold blood by a Taliban major. Their bodies are laid out in a makeshift morgue. Such atrocities are undermining the local people's endurance for the continued fighting. I'd like my country to be at peace again. I want to be quiet again in my country. I've had enough of this war. I want peace for my country too. I want to be the leader, the Muslim who's able to bring peace to the region. The war is no good to anyone. It's useless. There's no doubt that the Afghans are tired of this long war. Every Afghan is demanding peace, but peace with freedom and pride. For us as well as the Taliban, if we want the country to regain peace, if we want to find a solution for Afghanistan, the best form of peace is to go to the nation and allow the Afghan people to choose their own destiny in a democratic manner. The only way to find a solution for the Afghan problem is through elections. In the same way we defended ourselves against the Soviets, we're obliged to defend ourselves against Pakistan. We have to rise up and resist them. I consider this war to be for the national liberation of my country. The attack on Talakan has left 55 dead and 100 injured. But it hasn't been a bad day for Major Massoud. His forces have managed to halt the Taliban's advance and capture a number of militia. 
Here are 14 of them. Four of them are Pakistani. The camera's presence encourages Masood's men to remove the irons which are chained to the prisoners' feet. These men will be sent to a detention centre before being exchanged for rebel prisoners. But nothing in this war is clear cut. Fighters frequently defect to the opposing forces, maintaining the conflict's long uncertainty. Here, 12 majors have just left the Taliban camp to rejoin the ranks of Massoud's rebel army. <coughs> After making them wait, Masood receives them in the early hours of the morning. He'll use this opportunity to debrief the soldiers. In order to save their necks, they claim they chose their moment to defect. When rebel forces arrived in their village, they could leave the Taliban and rejoin the famous Masood. The next day, the fresh bout of bombing has convinced some women to take their children and leave Talakan. Heaped awkwardly into one truck, their destination is uncertain. But many women decide to stay. There's little for them anywhere. There are 97,000 war widows in Afghanistan, and they live in the utmost misery, struggling from day to day. It's like this. One day we eat, and another day we don't. If I buy clothes, I can't feed my children. If I feed them, I can't dress them. That's life. I make stuffed pastries and chickpeas, and my children try to sell them on at the market. I've pawned my house to survive and came here to seek refuge. My husband wasn't even a rebel, but a delivery man in the town. He disappeared when the Taliban were chased out. Nosy believes her husband was murdered by the Taliban. She has a message for the outside world. I want to send our greetings to the French women and ask them to help the Afghan women, who are just like their mothers and sisters. In recent years, there have been few concessions given to the rights of women, whether under rebel or Taliban command. The iron rule of the Islamic fundamentalists makes the chadri compulsory, and women are unable to go out of their houses without wearing it. The conservatism of this region adds to the weight of tradition in a male-dominated society. No, I don't accept the chadri. I wish I could be free, like I am at work and I could walk about in the street or market like that. Now that I'm old, the chadri is a good thing for me. <laughs> the touch of irony is light relief from what most women really think of the chadri. They have to get rid of our chadri. The following day, the Taliban retreat returns life here to some sort of normality. The famous Talakan cameras reappear on the streets. And public speakers begin to harangue the crowds once more. Since September 1996, the civil war has claimed the lives of 20,000 Afghans, three quarters of them civilians. An airlift is organized. Major Massoud's helicopters evacuate the injured and bring in new weapons, according to some observers, Kalashnikovs from Iran and mines. But the war here has been going on for so long that some of these men have never lived without it. For them, the war's in their blood. Near Massoud's headquarters, his men are giving prayers to Allah, 
just as the Taliban are a few kilometers away. A shared God in the face of a divided land.